In a world that feels unstable and a time that feels tumultuous, we stop to say thank you to those who were willing to be the stability and chose to advocate for peace, who saw a vision for the country that is safe and secure, formidable and full of freedom. Thank you to each veteran who stepped into endless days and stood watch over long and dark nights, who left family and home and sacrificed personal security to follow in the remarkable footsteps of fellow veterans who came before. When the time came and the nation needed you, you answered the call and have left your own brave imprint on this country. Thank you is never enough. But we are thankful. Hey, we, we often take for granted the freedom that we have. But behind our freedom was people that stood up and went and fought and literally gave it their life sacrificially. And I thank God for our veterans. Thank them for their service and for their compassion and for loving us in that way that they would go on our behalf. So on a day like this, we do pause and we stop and we recognize them and say the words with our applause, thank you for your service. So I'm gonna recognize the areas of service and if that is you, I'm gonna ask you to stand up. With all those that served in our United States Army, will you now stand? For all those that serve the United States Marine Corps, you will now stand. For all those that served in the United States Navy, will you stand? United States Air Force, if you'll now stand. United States Coast Guard, if you'll now stand. <clears throat> we stop and we give thanks to God for our freedom. And we stop and also give thanks to those that have served. But if it wasn't for our freedom, we could not be here today. I, there's a lot of people in our nation or in the parts of the world that would love to be where we're at right now to walk in with the Bible freely to worship God and not have to worry about being persecuted or bombs going off and all the things, the craziness of this world right now. So can we just pause in this moment and go to our Heavenly Father and thank Him for His goodness. God, I thank You for everyone that stood. Lord, I thank You, Lord, for the freedom that we have, Lord, for the nation that we live in. Lord, sometimes we get so comfortable, Lord, that we get to do this. Lord, we can walk the streets, come to church, carry a Bible, lift up the name of Jesus, and do it with confidence, knowing that we live in a land that is free. But Lord, we also know that it came because people stood on our behalf. They went and they fought. And Lord, I thank you, God, for their lives. I thank you, God, for their families and their spouses that stood behind them. And Lord, had to go through the heartbreak of watching them walk out the door and serve in foreign soils and places here in the States. So Lord, we just thank you, God, for our freedom. And we thank you, Lord, for these men and women that have served for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us? Let's worship together. Here's a song we can learn together. Focus this on one name, always, only Jesus.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there is peace within
did a wonderful job today if you uh, if you could are you doing anything right now yeah. I'm ready I'm so sorry don't worry listen anything else you need to say when a pastor comes up behind you you get out the way <laughs> that was an encouraging song wasn't it my favorite line in the song was I speak Jesus for my family can we just say the name of Jesus together one two three Jesus. I, I know that you came here today. Some of you came here pumped up and ready to go for service. Some of you came here, maybe you got dragged in the door by somebody. <laughs> Some of you came here just tired. Well, I tell you what, it doesn't matter how you came in. It's that song there that we need. And it's the one that song is about because we all come in here and Pastor Tony's going to deliver a message, but he's only going to do one thing is he's going to point you to Jesus. Because when you come here, the only one we really need is Jesus. You know, we, we, all, we all are here and I, I just, I want to tell you some good news. This past Thursday, God was working again. I say again because he's been working in our church. He's been working through your lives. Uh, this past Thursday, we had 77 families come through our family pantry to be served food. And I praise God how he provides. And I want to tell you what, two people came through the pantry coming to get food. But man, they got Jesus because they trusted Jesus as Savior at the pantry on Tuesday. God is working here. And he's answering our prayers. Uh, I, I saw on the order of service today, and I don't know if they all made it today, but there are 12 people scheduled Amen. to get baptized in this service. And this is what we're doing. This is, this is the whole message that we're, we're going forward for the gospel. We're here to learn today what God has for us. I got to teach in Starting Point just this morning to a group of new people that are here at the church. And the first value that I got to teach them was that this family that we're here for, this family that we are at Fellowship, we are a truth-sharing family. And what that means is that we hold the Bible above culture, traditions, and opinions. And when you come in here today, we're coming to tell you what Jesus has to say. We're coming to tell you what the Bible has to say. So let's do this as we begin this morning. Can we pray together and give this time to the Lord? And let's just ask Jesus to do something in our midst. Ask him to do something in your life in our church family today. Let's pray. Father, I come to you and we just say thank you. Thank you that when we come here tired, you told us that you'll give us rest in our souls. Lord, we thank you that when our world is going crazy, when there's so much chaos and so many questions in our minds, every time we turn on the news, we thank you that you are in control. We thank you that you give us answers according to your word and that you will be with us through it all. Lord, I pray for those that are here today that don't know you. God, help us to welcome them into our church family. Help us to love and care for them. But God, I pray most of all they'd come to know you as their Savior. 
Oh, I pray for all of those today that are newly part of the family of God. They're getting baptized today. I pray you'd bless them, that you'd help them as they have, Lord, came to you for forgiveness and salvation. God, I thank you for that, but I pray you'd help them as they continue forward in following you. Lord, help us to welcome them in. And and I just ask, God, that you would speak to our hearts today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the songs. We thank you for who you are. Please help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us? This is our last Sunday in this room for some months. And I think the focus should not be on uh, new equipment or a redesigned room or good lights that work. But, but the focus should be on our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Let's do that together. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid Him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heaven's soul Messiah still
Father, we thank you for your provision for us and taking such good care of us. We take a moment and we thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the blood of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the eternal security we have because of salvation through your son. In particular, we are such a blessed church. All these many years to have the gospel preached. All these many years to have people saved. All these many years to have people baptized. All these many, many years to have people join arm in arm in the great work of the ministry. We thank you for continuing that through us today. We thank you for this time of worship with God's people. What an encouragement it is. What a thrill it is to stand with saved people and sing your praises. I pray that you would keep that in us as the week continues. We love you. We thank you for this time of preaching in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. That music was awesome. And I'll tell you what, we irritated the devil today. Anytime you start saying the name of Jesus, you make the devil mad, and I'm all in favor of that all day, every day. Uh, take your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. Uh, I will get back to Hebrews, I promise. I am excited about the last messages that I'm going to do. Uh, we're going to get into some really cool uh, stories and studies uh, dealing with the book of Hebrews. Uh, but right now, just in light of what's going on, I really wanted to take some time and just stir us up of what the Bible says, especially about end times and things that are happening in the world. And just um, and how, that, how does that apply to us uh, while you're turning in your Bibles, I've got a cool announcement. Uh, we had an addition to our church yesterday. God bless Pastor Bryce and Lydia with a baby boy. And uh, Peter Michael Copeland was born yesterday, November 11th at 1.14 in the morning. Seven pounds, eight ounces, 20 inches long. Lydia and Peter are doing great. And we're so excited uh, for them. We th we're just so thankful for... Uh, Bryce and Lydia and all that they do uh, for our church and our teens and Catalyst Group and stuff. They're such a, uh, such a great addition to our church family and uh, to our ministry team. And so we love them to death. So be in prayer for them. I'm sure they're exhausted and we're going to give them some time uh, to recuperate and stuff. So you might not see them over the next week or two or whatever. Uh, but I, I want to I look into this. Like what does this mean for us as the church? You say, Pastor Tony, we're not in biblical prophecy. You know, you're just like, you, you see Gog and Magog in Russia, and you see Israel and all these things. But let me tell you, we might not be, but the church is. The Bible speaks to the church. The Bible talks about what's going to happen and the end times for the church. I want us to have an understanding for this, because what I'm about to say and the signs that I'm talking about might come back and say, that's not what I was expecting. Because a lot of things that we look for is like, uh, you know, the one world government and the Antichrist and all these different things. Don't get me wrong. All that is part of end time prophecy. Uh, what, what's going to happen in the end times when it comes to uh, the, the economy and, and, and how no man can buy or sell unless they have the mark. And that's what we normally gravitate to. I want to I treat this different. I want to go into this different. Paul is writing to the church. In Thessal uh, the church of Thessalonica, and we'll get to Revelation in a minute. And he was telling them, because they were all like caught up, like, what is, what is the coming of Christ? What does this look like? And they're all talking about this. And he said, now we beseech you, brother. And he said, let, 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 me, let me get your attention. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the gathering together unto him, he said, they were, they were worked up. And he said, hey, whoa, 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 hey, let, let, me, let me teach you some things. Let me explain some things that have to happen. He said, I don't want you to be soon, uh, not sh soon shaken in mind. I, I don't want you being troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letters as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. He said, let me explain this to you. He said, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. He goes, listen, it's not going to come until something happens, except there come a falling away first, and then the man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition, talking about the Antichrist. A falling away. And in order for there to be a falling away from something, there first has to be a, a, a time of clinging to something. And, and I want you to understand of how our world and how our culture has changed so much. And, and, and for some of you, you'll be able to recognize this right away. Back in the day, just not too long ago, during the time of D.L. Moody and Billy Sunday, when there was revivals breaking out and the great revivals that we talk about, where these men of God would get up and preach, 
And they would have thousands of people saved and they would fill coliseums and they would fill stadiums and they fill churches. They would close down bars. They would close down schools. They would gather in that place. They would preach the gospel for hours on end and thousands of people would be saved. And our generation, when I say our generation, at least uh, associating with people that are in this room, we had the, the era of Billy Sunday that would go in and have the crusades. How many of you ever heard Billy Sunday preach before or like that? L raise your hand right now if you heard Billy Sunday preach. So there was a lot more in the first service. Okay, there was a lot more in the first service. And during that time, they would come in and do the crusades, and they, they would get up and preach, and thousands of people would respond to the gospel. Now, we talk about filling stadiums today and seeing God work in that way, and we're thinking, I, I have not seen that. I've not seen that in our culture today. Now, if you fill a stadium up, it, it's, it's because Taylor Swift came into town or because the Buckeyes were played, not because somebody was preaching the gospel in that way. There, 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 things have changed. The world has changed. So when the Bible's talking a great falling away, in 1962, the Supreme Court voted to take prayer out of school. Things began to shift. I, I, I don't have time to go into it, but if you look at the stats of, of crime that increased and, and uh, uh, how, how pregnancies out of wedlock and how uh, just uh, all these different the families, divorce, all these things, things began to take a shift as we begin to get away from God's word. A grave falling away. Less and less churches preaching the gospel. More and more people doing that which is right in their own eyes. It's not just a matter about compromising against the word of God. It's just simply about getting lazy with the word of God. People say, I know what the Bible says, but I grew up that way and I had it shoved on my throat and now I just don't care about that. And I, I'm not going to be drugged to church. It's not my thing. And the world has changed. I don't view things in that way. Slowly, but slowly, but surely, we, we had the word of God that we, this, this, is how we, this is how we operate as a family. This is what the Bible says about marriage. This is what the Bible says about sexuality. This is what the Bible says about finances. We sat it down and slowly we began to do what is right in our own eyes and we get into a mess. It does not work. The Bible is telling us that in that day there will be a great falling away from truth. And it affects our families. Marriages are not thriving like they should be. They're barely held together. There's strife and arguing and bickering and whatever. Why? And you look in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say that it should be that way. When it talks about revival in the church and seeing people fall down on their faces and we before God craving for revival, we're not seeing that. What is missing? Because the Bible says that God is the same God today, yesterday, and forever. So what happened? The book of Revelation gets into things that are end times. We normally talk about Revelation when it comes to the Antichrist and the, 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 all the different things that are going to happen. And we, we know about the end times. But did you notice that chapters 1, 2, and 3 deal with the church? It's all about the church. Now I'm going to show you guys something that's so important. Revelation chapter 3 verse 14. And he says unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write. So I, I, I want, and people say the book of Revelation is not about the church. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 is all about the church. We, before you get into chapter 4, you get into verse 32, or chapter 3, verse 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. So all, the, all these instructions that are happening are to the church. Now there, here's the thing, and I, I want to challenge you with this. From chapter 4 to the end of Revelation, I'm going to ask to everybody that says, I don't understand what happens in the end time. Where does the church go? Because if we're mentioning 20 summer, crazy amounts of times over and over again, it's just saturated with chapters 1, 2, and 3 with the church. What happens to the church? Where does the church go? Let me show you this. Finish verse 22, and I say it unto the church. Chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice, which I heard as if it was of the trumpet... I heard a trumpet talking to me and said, come up hither and I will show you the things that must he be hereafter. And immediately, from the immediately, from earth to heaven, I was in the spirit. And behold, uh, there was a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So if you get into it, after the church is mentioned, at the end of the church, we opened up the next chapter. What happens? 
we see being called up hither, called up to heaven, a voice of a trumpet. For anybody that knows prophecy, what are we waiting on? The trump of Christ. We shall be gathered up and called up to him to be forever with the Lord in the clouds. He calls us home. Then what happens? We're, we're transformed not from this body into a spiritual body. Then we're in the presence of the king and the throne. What do we see in heaven at this time? We see Jesus on the throne and then worshiping him as the lamb that was slain. And you say, who is that? The angels are not worshiping as the lamb that is slain because they were never bound in sin like we were to need the redemption of Jesus Christ. It talks about the saints coming and casting their thrones before God. That is us. We receive the crowns here on earth for the service that we do. We cast it before God and we worship him as king of kings and lord of lords. Then the judgment on earth starts. How do you know that we will not be here during the tribulation period? And I know some of you are like, I have no idea what he's talking about. And for some of you, there's a lot of people that have different views of this. I would love to challenge you in your digital notes this morning that we have in the Church Center app. Down at the bottom, there's a thing that says more resources. There's a podcast, multiple podcasts that we have taught through this in detail. I want you to understand what the Bible says about this. But I want to see what happens after God calls us home there is an outpouring of the wrath of God. But the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom hath raised from the dead, even Jesus, now listen to this, which delivered us from the wrath to come. What did God say about us as Christians? Because of what Jesus Christ did, because I'm a child of God, what he did was not just save me from hell. The Bible says that he saved me from the wrath to come. You say, that's not talking about the tribulation period, that's talking about hell. Let me show you something. Revelation 6, verse 17, when it actually gets into the tribulation, when it actually gets into the wrath of God, when things actually happen, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Is that clear? When God said, Liz, literally, what I'm going to do is, what's going to happen after we see heaven? We step to the edge of heaven and God begins to pour out his wrath. And you know why God pours out his wrath. It's not because God doesn't love us. It's because God does love us. That's why he died on the cross to save us. If we reject the salvation of God, then we accept the damnation of hell and sin that's to come. I know this is like, whoa, like, this is crazy. You're thinking, what does this have to do with us? Can I rewind a little bit? Can we go back to that last church that's mentioned, the last of the church, and before we get into this, and before we start talking about what happens through the tribulation period, we get into the church. And the Bible says in Revelation 3, verse 14, and unto the church of Laodicea write, I want them to know something. These saith the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou art cold or hot. And then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. I, I will, uh, listen to this. God is saying this to the church. He said, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich. I'm increased with goods. I have Wi-Fi. I have a car with air condition. When it's cold outside, I have a remote start. I have subscriptions that I can listen to any song at any time and I pay for it without even thinking about it. I have multiple car payments. I have a house payment that I pay without even thinking about it because we bought beyond our means, but we wanted that house. I'm good. And thou knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So what is he saying with this? Now, for some Christians, you're going to be like, I've heard this a thousand times. If you've been in Fellowship Baptist Church, I've preached this multiple times. But I'm telling you, I'm not going to get away from preaching this, especially the closer we get and the more signs that we see of things happening in the world. Amen. The question is, what is the condition of the church? Why is it that this is the last word spoken to the condition of the church before the Lord comes back? The question that I'm asking is, what should we do? Because in verse 15, he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. What does that mean? He said, that, he said I would that thou art cold or hot, because then thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot. I will spew thee out of my mouth. So the question is, what should we do? Number one, that the Bible is confronting, telling us to confront our apathy. 
out of all the sins, and we could say in the last days, the horrible sin of the church is fornication, or the horrible sin of the church is greed, or the horrible sin of the church is gossip, or whatever. And God said, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. You take the giant that I created, you take the one that is supposed to be so strong that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it, and let them fall asleep. That is the sin of the church of the last days. Where we sit on our hands, where God is showing us what's happening in Israel, God shows us what's happening in the world, and there is a great falling away. I'll tell you, if the Bible says that the sign of the times is a great falling away, there should be a great clinging to by the church. It should be that I rise up and I'm not going to be passive to skip church. I'm going to be passionate to be there in church. I'm going to make the Bible the priority of my day, the priority of my life, the priority of my marriage, the priority of my kids. I'm going to rise up and cling to it. You know why? Because I know what the Bible says. And by the way, church, you do too. Nobody's going to sit here and go, what in the world? What is he talking about? And I know we have guests here, and I know we have people that maybe you say, I I don't understand this, but man, it's not an accident that God brought you here today to hear this truth. The truth of the matter is they were comfortable. They existed, but they existed with no passion. They had blessings that were passed down to them. They didn't have to work for it. They had it given to them. I'm talking about spiritually speaking. And I think, what does that look like? Man, we can sing a song about, I speak the name of Jesus over you. The fact that Jesus came and died and rose again. And on the cross, he dealt with our sin and our past and our shame. He dealt to overcome all the addictions that we have in life. We get into the church today. We begin to sing about how God did that for us. And then here's our result of it. It's like, mumble the words. It doesn't affect our heart. It doesn't reach our heart. It doesn't reach our tears. It doesn't, nothing stirred up inside of us. We're going through the motions. We're looking at our watch. And we're, we're, we're talking about the king of kings that saved us and changed us. And I'm not saying it has to be a wild, crazy show. But I'm telling you, if it doesn't hit your heart, something's wrong. Something is wrong. Anytime we hear the name of Jesus, that is the hope that changed my life. It should stir my heart. And every one of us is different, and every one of us worships different. But I promise you, if the thought doesn't enter your mind that God is good and God blessed you, something's wrong. He was just saying to the church that you you, you are apathetic. Getting to the point where we can talk about we're going to have outreaches, and we can set aside four hours for sports, but we can't set aside one hour to reach people. Something is wrong with the church. Something, something got off. When we can sacrifice, and if the new iPhone comes out, we'll get in line and sleep out in front of the store and pay 1200 bucks to have a feature that does, you don't even need on the stupid dumb phone. It's just some sort of new thing, but you don't give a dollar to missions to save people that are going to hell. Something is wrong. We don't mind sacrificing. We don't mind giving as long as it's something in us. And that's what he said. You've become increased with goods. You're blessed. And you sit on the blessings of what God has given us. If you were to talk to this church, they would come up and say, hey, you know, like, what's going on? It's like, well, we're okay. How's church? Oh. How's, How's your worship? It's good. It's fine. You know, it's just that, you know, like, I, I, I go. I mean. I'm there when I can. I'm going to try to. The world's going to hell. I, yeah, I know. They're doing this outreach thing. But man, I'm just, I'm just so... Saturdays are mine. Saturdays are mine. Sundays are mine. It's like, what? God is telling us in this passage of being apathetic. Because if the church says, I'm doing okay, can I just lay it out there? Being okay is not okay with God. And maybe you don't understand that, but I'm asking you to hold, hang on with me as we get through this. He said, I know your works. He said, you're neither cold nor hot. So when you get saved, the Bible was given this illustrations of, uh, let, let, me, let me just use this. And I've used illustrations like this before. I'm a coffee drinker. How many of you guys are coffee drinkers? Help me out here. Okay. Coffee has to be one or two ways. It needs to either be hot or it needs to be cold. When I say cold, it needs to be ice. When I order iced coffee, I, Jenny and my kids can tell you, I order extra ice. I want it cold. 
If it gets warm, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pour it. I don't want it. But the idea is that God was saying cold or hot was a matter that when somebody gets around her and feels it, they can tell that there's something different about that, that there's something inside of that that makes it different to the world around it. If I pick up hot coffee, it was like, whoa, oh, wow, that's hot. That's why we have the paper sleeves and everything around it. And iced coffee, you'll have to put it down. It's like, man, that's really cold. It has an effect on the world around us. But the thing about it is if, 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 if God's working on the inside, it, it will show on the outside. People will be able to get around and say, wow, that, that feels different. That's different. In, in your job, in school, in work, in sports, or whatever, that the Bible is talking about, he said, I wish that you were either cold or hot, that there was something happened inside of you that made an obvious difference that you love God. Amen. That's the point. He said in verse 15, I, I would, I wish, I desire that you were cold or hot. Now, let me lay this out. Apathy is not okay with God. Yeah, we, we, the thing is, we start off this way. When we're first saved, it's like, man, I can't wait to get to church. We're listening to podcasts. We're reading our Bibles. We'll stay up late and read another passage. And somehow along the way, our Bibles get sat down. And we can binge watch the series on Netflix without even thinking about it. People are filling the altars, getting saved. And we're complaining that the church goes too long. We will stay an extra 15 minutes at a movie theater for the after credit scene. But if church goes 10 minutes over, we're upset. What's happened to us? I'm not saying that this is all of us. I'm, I, I'm, I'm literally, when you go to the doctor and he puts the cuff on you and sits there and does the blood, it's like, how are we doing? How are we doing? Because the Bible is very clear that God is not okay with, with, uh, with, with apathy. You just say, how does that happen? How, how was I so, one so on fire for God? And I mean, I would witness to people all the time, and I just ask you, when's the last time you shared your faith with somebody? I'm writing this message, and I'm drinking iced coffee in my office. Got up and went out. I ran out. I ran did different things, and I had all these things going on. I met with some people, came back to my office, grabbed my iced coffee, and it was warm. Here, I literally snapped the picture. I was like, this is it. Let me just tell you right now, that is gross. So, hey, that is, I'm telling you, you say, how was the rest of it? Did you endure it? Nope, I dumped it out. It was gross. You say, Pastor Tony, how did it become lukewarm? And the lukewarm is, you just say, what is the temperature? How does that happen? All you have to do is let it sit. So what do you have to do to become apathetic? Oh, the answer is so easy. Nothing. Nothing. Just let it sit. Do you know what happens? I don't care how cold something is or hot, how hot something is. When you let it sit, it adapts to the temperature of its atmosphere. And lukewarm is that description that says you're just adapted to the culture around you. You go to work, and you're way more excited about telling them about the score of the Buckeye game or whatever your team is than you are about telling them how Jesus worked in your life that weekend. The Bible tells us and goes into this and explains. He said, as many as I rebuke, or as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He said, I go after them, be therefore zealous and repent. Because God is explaining that apathy is sin. Just kidding, Elaine. The, the reason why he said you're lukewarm, and then he turns around and he says, I rebuke you, and he tells you to repent. Repent literally means to get it right, to change direction. It's not just a matter of like, oh, you know, the shrugging of the I'm okay, or the passiveness with music and the passiveness of worshiping and things like that. You just shrug your and it's not a big deal. Let me tell you, God's not just saying, oh, that's not good. God is literally saying, you need to get it right. God responds to their apathy. He said, I will spew thee out of my mouth. God's not trying to be gross or whatever is saying that, but he's given the illustration and the church of Laodicea. With the, the, anyways, the, the, there, there was a whole history that he was tying into the water that came into the city and how it was lukewarm. And they weren't known for their cold water. They were known for the lukewarm water. Nobody wanted to taste it. And everybody that drank it was just like, this is gross. It's like water from Laodicea. Who wants that? And God was saying, it's just like if you've ever 
drank spoiled milk before. Has anybody ever done that? You're like, you didn't realize it. It's a little chunky. Milk should not be chunky. Okay, just laying that out there. The first thing you do is you spit it out. It's gross. It's disgusting. God was literally saying, I have saved you from the pits of hell. I have redeemed you. I have blessed you. I gave you the word of God. You have the dwelling of the spirit of God. And you're going to sit there and become lukewarm. Gross. It's gross. What is God saying to the church of the last days? He tells us to repent of our apathy and don't get comfortable just because you live in the comforts of everything that's been given to us. But then there's a verse in here that I think sometimes we overlook. Or we'll put it out of context and we don't understand that this is church, talking to the church of Laodicea. Verse 20, he says, Behold... I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. This was a visual of God telling him, what should we do? God, we always talk about how God is seeking after us. The Bible is literally saying, I'm asking you to get up from your seat and seek after me. It is awesome. Let me tell you, out of everything that I could describe in this, how awesome this passage is. Because he literally goes from you're passive, you're sitting there, you're comfortable, you're not moving, you're not on fire. And God says, I'm going to come to your life or your heart and seek you out. Isn't it awesome that God, through conviction, is not going to leave us where we're at? And God does through this through different things. It might be a song on the radio. It might be a friend that's provoking you. It might be a life group discussion. It might be something you hear in church. But I promise you this. God is beating on our hearts, knocking on our hearts. He won't kick it open and say, I want to be in here. The whole idea that God is preaching or teaching through this is the fact that through our life, we get so busy and clutter our life that we push God to the outside. It's not that I'm not saved. It's not that I, I, I don't love God. He calls them the church. I mean, that, that's the same, the redeemed, those that are, are set apart for God. But he said, the problem is, he said, I'm no longer the center of your life. I'll ask you guys right now, as us as a church, would, would God say that I am the center of your relationships, the center of your marriage, the center of your worship? Let, let, me, let me put it like this. It, 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 I, let, me, let me go after the dads as I say this. I, let, hey, dads, would your kids be able to testify and say, my dad is passionate about Jesus? If it came to, like, which one is your dad more? Which one is, is more passionate in, in his life? Would it, would it be the Buckeyes or would it be Jesus? If my dad's going to uh, get excited about something, is, is, is it his favorite NFL team or any other sports or golf or whatever? Are, are they able to see it in your life? And if, if, if that's the truth, God is, for you right now, God's knocking on your heart saying, I want to be the center of your relationship. Do you know what I love about this passage? It's the fact that in our generation, we might not ever see another Billy Graham crusade. I don't know. I'm, I'm not saying because I'm, I'm not going to put God in a box. I don't know. But this is what I do know. According to that passage, I can experience personal revival with God. Amen. I can. So the world is going to hell and everything's falling apart. But you know what? My family can have Jesus as the center of it all. Amen. My life, my church, my relationships... He's literally knocking on the door. He says, if any man will hear my voice and respond, you see, true passion for God can only come from true relationship with God. Now notice what he says. Verse 19 is a result of this. And let me tell you, this last point cannot come without opening the door and asking God to come in. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous. Be zealous. Last message to the church. So we get into the end, and, and out, out of all the things, he, he, he doesn't just say, go out and evangelize, be a good dad, all this. The, literally, the passage that he's saying, therefore, he's, he says in there, be zealous, therefore, and repent. The word zealous comes from the word that means to be hot. God's desire for the church is to be zealous, which literally means that if I'm sitting there, God's working on my heart, and God says, I've got so much more. Can I tell you guys that we settle too much in life? It's like, man, we're just, man, we're doing great as a church. I'll tell you what, you know what's better than seeing somebody get saved? You say there's no such thing. as You know what's better than seeing somebody getting saved? Can anybody shout it out and tell me? Two people getting saved. 
You know what's better than two people getting saved? No, four. Well, oh, ye of little faith, let's go for it. Of just having the desire that God says that unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think, the church in the last days is, doesn't have a watered down version of the Spirit of God. God didn't say that you're going to just struggle through because I'm going to leave you. I'm going to randomly drop in and visit you. God literally says that I'll be with you to the very end. God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And all the instructions that God gives us of this, God says, I, ref you just, I want you to refuse to sit. Romans 12, verse 11, he said, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit. It literally means to be hot. The word fervent literally means to be hot or on fire for God. 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 15, 58 it says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye therefore steadfast, unmovable, always existing for the work of the Lord. Is that, is that what it says? Abounding in the work of the Lord. He said, I have come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. So the instructions that God gives us is, strictly, is, is literally this. You might be one of the people of the last days of Jesus Christ before he comes back for his church. But he says, it's time to go all out. It's time to be fired up. It's time for you to realize that what God has done and God's going to do and, and to just say, God, I want more. Ephesians 3.20 is one of my favorite passages. I, I, I've used it as, as a theme through Logan's entire journey. No one to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. But the rest of the verse says, according to the power that worketh in us. In us. It's where your kids get around and it's like, man, I'm going to, I wish my kids would go to church. I wish they would listen to me and respect me because they get around you and go, you know what? You're no different than the dad or the teacher or the politician. Dad, your spirit is the same, but let something be on fire in your life. And your kids will get around you and say, I don't know what's happening to the dad, but my dad is different. My mom is so on fire for God, and there's a spirit about her. There's a difference about her. When I, get in, when I get around my mom, or I get around my church, or I get around my life group, I get around whoever it is, those friends that I have, there is something different about them. And I promise you, that can be true with each and every one of us. It will just get up and go to the door when he's knocking and saying, I've got more for you. Simply say, I want it. I want it. I, I'm going to go all out. And every bit that God gives me the opportunity to do, I want to just go all out. And I, I, I just challenge you. I can't open the door for you. I can't. But I can tell you about the one that's knocking on the door of your heart. We're going to sing a song about hope. Because that's what I have and that's what the world needs. It's, it's not just a hope that exists. It's not archaic. It's not Old Testament. It's a living hope. A living hope that is available to every person that's here, whether you know Jesus or not. God has come to save you from the wrath to come. Because this world is falling apart quickly. But good news, I have the truth. And it will set you free. So we're going to sing a song in just a minute. And as we sing, I'm going to stand right here and others... If you want to come down and I tell you, you say, I want more, man, then seek the face of God. Fall at the feet of Jesus and say, I want more. And I'm sorry for the apathy that I've had in my life. I'm sorry for sitting. I'm sorry for just existing, but I want more. Let's pray. God, I pray that you will work in this service today. Lord, in this time, as we have a time of response, Lord, I, I don't know know how to ask just to be honest and transparent Lord that I want to see you work Lord I, I, in my life and my family and my kids and in our church but God I think that I, I know that I'm not the only one so Lord help us to respond as you call us in Jesus name amen you stand and sing stand and sing this it's open. You want to come pray. Break the mold. Maybe visualize that, that God says, are you going to open the door? You get up from your seat and say yes. 
I, I, I don't want, I, I'm going to push back the apathy. I'm going to push back the, I'm, I'm, I'm just stuck. I've not felt God work in my heart in a long time. Just stale. In desperation, I turn to heaven. Listen to these words. Spoke your name. You want someone to pray with? I promise you, we've got rows of people that are ready to pray with you. Not alone. See, I don't know what to do. I know that God's working in my heart. I don't, I don't know what to say. It's all right.
Sin was so powerful that everything that it touched, it corrupted and killed it. Like a disease, like no disease. I, I, I can't even think of a disease that I could use to compare it to sin. And it just, death passed upon all men for all have sinned. So we were all, all part of it. There's no shaking it. There's no getting away from it. The song means that Jesus, who knew no sin, stepped into our life, took on flesh, took on our sin, went to the cross and died in our place. Substitution. I stepped out, Jesus stepped in and he took it. But this time when death happened, it happened to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who never knew sin. He died. The blood of Jesus Christ covered our sin, but what gives us hope is he came out of the grave to say, hey, listen, there's hope beyond sin. There's hope beyond death. There's hope beyond the grave. We have living hope today. Living hope. And for some that are here today, you just say, I just, I just, I'm just here. Just this church thing, Sunday, I was trying it out. I don't know why I'm here. I want you to know that Jesus loved you so much that he came to die on that cross so that you could have that living hope. And by the way, you don't have to join the church. You don't even have to get baptized. You don't have to run down here and shake my hand to receive it. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's salvation. In that salvation, you can believe in your seat as you stand there. In that salvation, you can take out to the car and sit alone. And that salvation can be with you as God pricks your heart and doesn't let you sleep tonight, wakes you up in the middle of the night and says, I was talking to you at church today. And you accept him as your personal savior. Right now, you have chance, you have time, but there is coming a day when we stand before God and it will be too late because today is the day of salvation. Now is he extending the hope of salvation the question is, what are you going to do with the gift of salvation that he's offering? You can either accept it or you can reject it, but you reject it, you reject the hope that gives us for eternity. I'm going to go back to connecting point after this. And I am in that room. If anybody's here that says, Pastor Tony, I don't know if I know Jesus is my personal Savior. I don't have peace. I'll sit in that room all day. And everybody knows that I mean it. I will sit in that room all day until you know that you know that you know that you have Jesus as your personal Savior. That's what we're going to do today. It's an extended invitation. So I'm going to pray, but the invitation is not over. God, thank you so much, Lord, for salvation. Thank you, God, so much for hope. God, my, I'm, I'm heavily burdened, Lord, for the church. Lord, that we just get comfortable can brag on the fact of how long we've been in this building, or how long that we've been saved, or all the ways that we've served you. But Lord, none of that is excuses for the apathy of what's happening right now in our hearts and minds. Stir us up, God. Help us to be on fire and passionate. If we're the last voice of Jesus Christ, Lord, help us to shout it from the top of our lungs. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. All right, good morning. We have 10 people who are getting baptized today. That's exciting, isn't it? 10 people who have put their faith and trust in Jesus and who are ready to identify with Christ. That's what baptism is. It's identifying with Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It's a picture of the transforming power of the gospel. And I'm excited today for these 10. We've got some adults, we've got some teens, we've got some kids who have put their faith in Jesus and now they're ready to say, I'm committing to a life of following Jesus. And so baptism is a big deal. It is a big moment in someone's life of following Jesus. And I want to encourage you to help me celebrate with these who are taking this awesome step of obedience and faith. Um, it's a big moment and I want to invite you to do that with me. We're going to get started with Jessica. Jessica, you can come on down. And uh, this is Jessica, and you can turn right around this way. She uh, has been faithfully attending fellowship 
She serves the Lord. She has a heart for people. And I'm just so grateful that today she's coming here to take this step of obedience. Jessica, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation? Wonderful. Well, then it gives me a lot of joy, my sister, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. We're going to get our picture taken. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. All right, next up, we've got Sadie. We have a few getting baptized, so there may be some transition moments here. So, Sadie, come on down some help. We're grateful that you're here. I will say one thing about um, Pastor Bryce and Lydia. We celebrated with them. I know that he's happy uh, and they're happy, but we have some students, uh, real life students and college kids that are getting baptized today, and he was going to baptize, so I know he's missing that. This is one of them. We're so grateful for our real life students. We're thankful for Sadie. I've seen her around doing different things, serving in different ways. Sadie, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Awesome. That gives me a lot of joy then, my sister, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Awesome. All right, next we have Serenity. Serenity. And, uh, oh, here you go, Serenity. Can I help you come down? This is Serenity. And... Serenity is one of a couple kids that are getting baptized today. Serenity, we are very proud of you for this decision that you've made. Can I ask you this question? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus for salvation? Yes. Then it gives me a lot of joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Good job. Here, we're going to get our picture. Good job, Serenity. All right. We have our first guy. Landon, come on down, man. This is Landon, and uh, Landon and Serenity are siblings, right? So this is sibling number two getting baptized today. This is Landon. Landon, have you believed in Jesus Christ for salvation? Yes. Yes. He told me this morning, we came up, we showed him where things were going to be. I said, today's a big day. Are you excited? He said, yes, like you would expect him to say, right? But I know he's excited about getting baptized with his sisters and it gives me a lot of joy. On your profession of faith, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. We're going to get our picture taken. Man. Good job. All right. And now we have Olivia. Olivia. She said it's deep. Her sister said it's deep. I'm not going to let you drown. I promise. Here. Come here. Man. Oh, yeah. Here, you're going to want to stand on my foot there. You're going to sink, okay? Here, come here. All right. Stand right there, Olivia. There you go. I got you. This is Olivia, and she has put her faith and trust. Olivia, have you believed in Jesus Christ yes, for salvation? He's my Lord. He's my Lord. Amen. Then I baptize you in the name of the Father, yes. the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk hey, in newness. Oh, Woohoo! Oh, man, that was my favorite so far. Who do we got next? Jacob, come on down, man. This is Jacob. Jacob has a fan section. One of the coolest things about getting to baptize Jacob was I think it was the first or second week that our family was here back in June. I was in Starting Point, and this fellow comes up to me, and I was like, hi, I'm new. He's like, I'm new too. I'm Jacob. And he had just started attending and he had just put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He goes to Catalyst, which is our 18 to 25 year olds, uh, consistently, faithfully. He's serving and he already has a heart for people and I'm incredibly grateful for Jacob. Jacob, have you trusted Jesus as your savior? You ready to live for him the rest of your life? Then it gives me a lot of joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in death, raised to walk in newness of life. We're getting our picture taken, buddy. That's awesome. That's awesome. Next, we've got Alexis or Lexi. It's Lexi, right? Not Alexis. Lexi. Lexi, your family is all in the back, aren't they? Is that somewhere back there? Hi, Lexi's family. <laughs> She's excited to get baptized today. 
we're excited for you. Lexi, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Then it gives me a lot of joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Congratulations, congratulations. We've got a few more here. Nevea, come on down. Hey, Nevea. This is Nevea, another one of our real life students, faithfully serving the Lord in different ways, being here on Wednesday nights. Nevea, we're so grateful for you. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Are you ready to live for him the rest of your life? Then it gives me great joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. Let's get our picture taken. You did a great job. Congratulations. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Congratulations. All right. We've got two more. Let's see here. Penda. This is another one of our real life students, if you couldn't tell from the student section. Hey, Penda. Congratulations. Penda, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? And are you ready to live for him the rest of your life? Well, then it gives me a lot of joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Congratulations. Thank you. Right there, we're going to get our picture taken. Congratulations. All right, we've got one more. Craig. Come on down, Craig. You know what's so cool about Craig? Craig came to Fellowship Baptist Church for the first time last Sunday. And Craig put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ after the service last Sunday. And here he is this morning following the Lord in believer's baptism. Craig, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus? Are you ready to live for him? Then it gives me a lot of joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Congratulations. If you see these who've been baptized today, make sure to let them know how grateful and happy you are for them that they took this step of faith. Amen. That was awesome. Man, such an, an incredible day in church today. Uh, I've got a couple announcements and we're going to close this off in a pretty interesting way today uh, because this was the final service we're having in here uh we got to move over to the fellowship hall as we do the for the gospel project so this is this was it it was an exciting day right man it was cool okay so a um, couple things to remember uh if you are a deacon the deacons meeting has been moved to next sunday next sunday there's a lot going on today uh moved to next sunday also if you're a guest with us today i want to invite you to one of two places i uh, if you have questions about the Lord, if you want to get baptized, if you have anything that's going on in your mind and you just want to ask a question, right at the back, we have our next steps table. And those people are back there to help you take your next steps. Do you get it? Okay, uh, you get it, I get it. Uh, next steps, go back there. And if you have any questions, they, if you need a Bible, if you just have something going on and you just, I just don't know how to do this in the church, stop back there. Also, Pastor Tony will be in connecting point with our staff team. Uh, if you go out the doors, down the long hallway, you'll see a room near the Welcome Center entrance. We want you to come back there. Please make time if you can. If this is your first or second time, you've never been back there, please come back to connecting point. Uh, coming up, we've got a few key items on the agenda. Uh, we have our Grief Share Surviving the Holidays Seminar coming up. Check the Church Center app for details. That is on the 18th and also on December 2nd. And then next Sunday, we are changing it up. We have our Thanksgiving service next Sunday. And it's not going to be in here. It's going to be in the Fellowship Hall. So when you come next Sunday, service times are changed to 9.15 and 11 a.m., okay? So if, if you're an 11 o'clocker, don't worry about it. Come at the same time. But if you're an early early bird normally, 9.15. You've got to be an extra early bird. And come next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. And someone told me, no, we are going to have next week at the 9.15 service coffee and donuts. So come at 9.15. Yeah, you can clap for coffee and donuts. Why not? Uh... 9 15. 
Uh, we really, if you can come to 915 next week, we would love you to do that because honestly, we're not quite sure what it's going to look like in the fellowship hall. Y'all are going to be squeezed in, but we're going to have nice padded chairs. It's going to be a lot of fun, okay? But because our 11 o'clock is usually attended better, we're going to encourage you. If you say, I want to be that early bird, I want to get them donuts, come to 915, okay? If you say, I don't eat donuts, I don't do sugar, I'm diabetic, Come to the 915. Try it. It'll be fun for you, too. And uh, it's whatever. Um, We'll have coffee there for you. And, um, yeah, take your meds, and you'll be great. Um, All right, I want to give some closing instructions. Uh, We are part of something historic today, all right? As soon as I dismiss, I need every one of you able-bodied people to help with two things. Number one, I need every man that isn't going to get injured by lifting something to meet me right up front.